business, and he's doing all of these wonderful conferences. So he's going to give us an hour today, and hopefully he'll be able to come back in the future and talk about more things because I tell you, Ms. Paula, there is so much percolating on the burner. William, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hi. Uh, good to meet you, William. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Absolutely. We are so thankful to have you here. Your information is very intriguing. Um, the light of Scion is very intriguing. The Milky Way is rising. It's time to answer family. This is William Henry's new book, and we will be discussing this and many, many other details um, from his website and things of this nature. First of all, let me just start by this. Due to reading your profile, and you talking about ascension. Please explain what that really means, William, because I, I perceive that this quote-unquote new age society, if you will, niche, has really sort of kind of abused the word and overused it. So please explain your version of ascension. Well, I, I think it's uh, everybody kind of is entitled to their own personal definition or perspective on what ascension is, but... I went back and kept looking at the ancient texts, which were all based on the idea, especially with the the, the foundation of ancient Egypt, that they, they had this belief that we were in a sort of pupil phase when we're in the human body. The the thought was is that we all have the capability of metamorphosing or, or transforming into the next level of manifestation, which is of star being, a celestial being, a light being. And so, to me, ascension is this process whereby we transform ourselves into beings of light, what Jesus did in the resurrection, what Osiris did in his resurrection, what other figures have done, and then we go and dwell in the stars as star beings for eternity. So would you say, would it, you say that it has to do with the Adam Cad, gaining the Adam Cadman, activating yes. all 12 strands of DNA within the human body? Yes. Uh, the term that uh, I have really focused on in my research is one that appears in numerous cultures, and that is the word perfection. They talked about us per becoming just humans made perfect is one of the terms that the Bible uses. Jesus talked about the concept of perfection when the rich man was asking the secret of eternal life, and Jesus said, follow the commandments. And the the and Jesus re, and the man said I've always followed the commandments which are love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart all your mind all your soul that that's the key to ascension right there because Jesus said that if you can do those things you are on the path towards becoming a more perfect human which the word perfect means more whole more holy more complete and then ultimately it it refers to a state of ultimate manifestation as a human, as a light being. And family, for those who don't know what the Adam Cadman is, it is a term that is used in Kabbalah, the primordial man, the, I guess you could say, the higher aspect of self, the self that we truly are, going back to that and activating um, all of the strands of DNA because within our DNA strands family, not all of them are activated. And in this time, it is perceived through the alignment of the galactic center, that these DNA strands within our organic frame are being activated into the Adam Cadman, the, the primordial man. Is that correct, um, William? Yes, that's very well put. Very well said, yes. And, you know, also I perceive it as well, uh, since we're in, there's so many things to talk about when it comes to this whole activation, but do you also perceive that, we are getting an activation of the Merkaba, Metatron's cube, which is the flower of life. Um, because when you talk about the Milky Way, if you will, in this whole alignment, it seems that we are now being opened up. There are doorways that are being opened up in order to encode our, our physical frames, these signatures. And I can tell this through the eclipse. Me and Ms. Paul have talked about this on air. There have been very strange planetary alignments. There are no coinky dink, and I really believe those are doorways to let things in and to let things out, but also to activate certain sacred geometries within our physical frame to allow us to enhance our spiritual gifts, if you will. Yeah, yeah, I, I really uh, go right along with what you're saying, and that is a lot of the impetus for why I wrote 
my, my latest book, The Secret of Scion, which is about the, the ascension process and especially the role of the galactic core. I was surprised, or, or listeners might be surprised too, to learn that the ancients seem to have known a lot about the Milky Way. Mm-hmm. We, we didn't even know that there was a center to our galaxy until the mid-1930s, but yet the ancients kept trying to focus our attention on that place as a source place, as a, as a maybe even the place where our souls originated, and certainly as the dwelling place of these ascended beings. When you follow, for example, as I did in the book, the, 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 the ascension path of Jesus, you can see it in Christian art where they clearly show him going through the process of transfiguration where he begins to put on the light body, he begins to achieve his perfect body or sometimes called the glory body or the rainbow body. Then you see the art of the, the crucifixion where often uh, you, you see the images where it's a, kind of a, a just a horrifying kind of event where it's very bloodthirsty, it focuses on the violence and the sacrifice, but then there are other images of the crucifixion that show Jesus transforming into a radiant being of light, and this is consistent with what we see in the Shroud of Turin, where the resurrection is about him in an instantaneous flash of light beaming himself to some other location in the universe. And then in Christian art, you see him successfully having successfully completed that resurrection he is shown enthroned and when jesus is enthroned you you always know it because he's sitting on a rainbow or he's in a rainbow but it's never fully identified where what geographical location he has gone to reside in the name of the place is sion it's spelled s-i-o-n according to the book of hebrews this is where the ascended humans go and dwell this is the name of the throne of jesus but where is that place And so I started just pulling on this chain of references, this sort of golden rope, if you will, of references to where he went. And where I was led was the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And I've provided some of the supporting material that other traditions, including the Maya, including the Egyptian, and also uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints talks about perfected beings or ascended beings dwelling in the center of the galaxy as well. So it seems that What's been happening is that we've been coming around to a time now where since certainly the past 70 years, our consciousness has been expanding. We're beginning to focus on the center of the galaxy, and we're, and we're responding to what has been going on there in an energetic way. And you're absolutely right when you say about the ancients. They knew a heck of a lot about the galaxy because speaking to my elders, when we talk from a metaphysical, um, cosmic way of reality, the information is startling, William. I'm like, are you serious? I mean, and, and as my elder says to me, there are many things that are hidden in plain sight. Absolutely. And, um, you know, when my elder uh, breaks down some of the symbols in my tradition and why certain things are done, and he talks about the galaxy and the way that the galaxy spins and so on and so forth, it is literally mind-blowing. It's just, it's mind-blowing, if you will. And you're, I believe that we're moving into a new timeline where people call the new age, what it really is, is the old age, old ancient technological no that is now resurfacing and being reawakened within our DNA, and it's fabulous. Oh, I agree. On my website, I have a quote from the book of Jeremiah that says, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good or godly way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. So what we're calling New Age is really a rediscovery of perhaps what we might call the original sacred tradition or sacred revelation. We're starting to get back to what our original purpose was, and that is to fully maximize our experience here in this earth school, this school for souls, and put ourselves on this path of Christhood, ascensionhood, light body effect, whatever term you want to give to it, this is our ultimate goal. And speaking about the ancients one more time, there's also evidence historically uh, when you look at the Native Americans, if you will, there are certain tribes in the United States 
who have literally disappeared William. Um, they're nowhere to be found. <laughs> They've left artifacts. They've left their cave dwellings. And I, I can't recall the tribe in Colorado. I grew up in, in Denver, even though I, I've lived in New York for 20 years. But there's this very famous tribe who literally um, disappeared off the face of the earth. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, what were you going to say, Ms. Paula? The Anasazi. Yes, I was wondering if they knew of this knowledge from the cosmos and literally took the, the golden ticket pass at that period of time and decided to leave this reality. Well, that's a, a, a very good possibility. I mean, we know that the Anasazi had help from celestial beings or star beings. They helped save them during a cataclysm and then by taking them into the inner, inner earth and then brought them back to the surface and taught them all kinds of star legend and star lore, especially concerning Orion. Um, I'm very fascinated by, as I mentioned, the, the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. They have a belief that in ancient times in America existed a place called the City of Enoch, which is a, a city of the righteous, which is a word that means the good people or the godly people. These are people on the, the divine path. They're not when you call someone righteous, it doesn't mean they're self-righteous. We all know those kinds of folks. But these are people that wanted to live the good, the godly, a divine life dedicated to achieving their full human potential at the same time that they're uh, worshiping the, the, the divine, the creator. And w what they talk about is that this whole city, uh, a whole population of people achieved this level of perfection and purity and were literally, to use their term, translated to... God's home planet called Kolob in their tradition, which is located, according to some Latter-day Saints theorists, at the center of the galaxy. What's amazing about this is that just this year there were, or excuse me, in 2011, there were Russian scientists at the at Moscow uh, universities that talked about the physics and making it possible that there could, in fact, be a super advanced civilization that dwells on a planet in the center of our galaxy and that they would have learned how to harness the power of the black hole that exists there. So that's a very, to me, powerful example of how you have this tradition that's describing an event, a translation to the center of the galaxy at a time when we didn't even know we lived in a galaxy, let alone that this galaxy had a center. And so here they are identifying this specific location in space and here's modern science now saying, yeah, wait a minute, we, we think this could actually be possible. And also I, I heard you speak of a discovery that NASA made in 2010, I believe, about an energy percolating in the center of the galaxy, and they actually have pictures of it. William, can you go into more depth about that? Yeah, this is something that's extremely important in, in context of the Maya 2012 prophecy and their suggestion that we're going to be aligning in a, in a rare and dramatic way with the center of the galaxy, that the gospel of 2012, which, which I referred to the, the belief system around 2012 because everybody's got their own idea of what it is, but the basic gospel or good news of 2012 is that we're going to experience this galactic alignment, that the center of the galaxy is going to open and it's going to release a channel of energy that is going to bring a, a higher vibration that will raise the vibration of everyone and everything on the planet. And this is plays into that whole ascension concept. Well, lo and behold, November 2010, NASA announces that they have discovered these massive gamma ray bubbles that are emerging from both the, the top and the bottom of our Milky Way galaxy, and they're completely baffled by this. But yet, when you go back into the ancient times, as we were saying, and, and accept or at least contemplate the possibility that they possessed a Milky Way-based metaphysics. In other words, they, they talked about celestial or star beings that educated them, and it's, it's my supposition that if they are visited by star beings in the ancient times, that, those star beings must have been at least the level of sophistication, astronomically speaking, that we're at today. And they would know about our galaxy. They would know our galaxy is one in a, in a beautiful garden of over 450 billion galaxies. And they would be able to instruct the people and say, hey, uh, there are sacred energies that emanate from this source place, and you want to begin to connect your consciousness to those energies. 
one of those traditions, I believe, is the, is the Judeo-Christian tradition, specifically the story of Moses and the Israelites. If we think of Moses as one of these Milky Way metaphysicians, then we start to ask, well, what was that cloud by day and pillar of fire by night that the Israelites were following when they were wandering around the wilderness for 40 years? There are some that believe that it was actually the light of the Milky Way. And if that's true, then could it be possible that NASA has actually rediscovered this cloud of energy that resembles a pillar that's emanating from the center of our galaxy? And if so, maybe we want to start paying attention to these discoveries and recognize that, hey, it's part of our job is to learn to tune into these vibrations coming from the galactic center because they're here to awaken us, enlighten us, and transform us. You are absolutely correct, Miss Paula. Do you, do you, I have so many questions that I that I want to ask you, and I want to jump in here and see if Miss Paula has some things to say. <laughs> well, I just uh, taking what he's saying and, and kind of connecting the dots with things that that I've read in the past and uh, things that I've just recently started delving into a little bit deeper uh, than what I had been because uh, I got busy being on the road for for several years and and had kind of uh let my uh my metaphysical studies go go to the the wayside but uh, here lately have picked them back up uh you know as we start talking about uh like the agenda 21 and uh you know how things are you know moving more toward the one one world order the one world government and how all these other things come into play and how and we've had talks about the illuminati and and how this group is connected to it and that group and and different things and and this just kind of connects a lot of the dots <laughs> Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And I I have to be the devil's advocate here, William, as what Miss Paula just said. And as what you're saying, there are two ends of the spectrum. From This is just from my perception. And I'd like to, to get some feedback from you. As we are going into all of this this beautiful awakening, if you will, our physical element is getting these signatures, these downloads. Is there a flip side to this, a dark side to this, meaning that as we are the light bearers of humanity, there's also the flip side of this that does not want this to happen. And what I mean by this, William, is I've noticed that as we have progressed, as time goes on, that some people on the planet really cannot handle the frequency, if you will, and they're literally starting to go crazy and to lose their mind. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it's uh, I've, I haven't paid a lot of attention to that scenario you've just been describing, but recently it's been presented to me several times, and I, I, I've just learned that there is this what they what I call the ascension deception, and there's a, a group of people out there, some researchers, authors that are presenting a scenario that basically says the moon. Is, an art, is a spaceship, it's inhabited by reptilian beings who sent false gods to us in the past and they gave to us this teaching about love and light. And essentially what they're trying to convince people to say is that if you're following the love and light path, you're headed into a reptilian trap. If you believe the path to ascension is through love and light, you, you're going to have a really rough ride because you're going to come into contact with some very powerful, dark, ent negative entities. And I fundamentally disagree with that. I don't know why someone would come to this kind of a conclusion and, and want to really put this kind of doubt in people's minds. There isn't uh, a, a, hardly a tradition on the planet that you can visit that doesn't tell you that the way to achieve our ultimate ascension is to become a being of pure light and pure love and it, it's just beyond my comprehension that that authors and researchers would be warning people about that path what they believe that you need to do is follow a particular teaching about advanced physics of ascension and this kind of thing and i just uh i just at this point have uh, some serious questions about uh 
whether or not you have to learn this physics of ascension or if instead you just focus on, as every ancient tradition has suggested, becoming a, a, a being of greater love and greater life. Indeed. I, you know, it's interesting. I feel that at this, this, this time right now can be real tricky. You have to have your spiritual, metaphysical awakening, like real awakening, keep your eyeballs open type of hat on. Because there are two realities that are permeating. There are people who are waking up and they're, they're realizing certain aspects of self and compassion and love. And then there are the dark bears, if you will, who do not want that to happen, if you will. And they will do whatever it takes to deceive the light bears. Um, of humanity from staying on the path and the road and using distractions, if you will, from keeping them um, on the right path because, you know, nature is duality and many gray areas in between. So I look at everything from many different perspectives, but I feel that there is that aspect that there are individuals who are monitoring the situation, if you will, with people who are waking up and trying to do everything that they can, boomerang um, their program and trying to, to steer them off the path. I believe that that is happening, but I do not believe that um, following the, the love and the light path is, is the wrong way. Love is the most powerful energy on the planet. Um, it is what brought us into being. If it wasn't for the essence of love, we would not exist. <laughs> so it's it's a very fascinating paradigm, um, William. It is, and um, it's very uh, much appreciated that the conversation is about this subject. Um, there's lots of ways we can talk about it. I mean, a couple of points I would make is that the Gnostics were ones who were – the earliest Christians, of course, were the Gnostics. They were those on the Enlightenment path and the Awakening path, and nobody was messed with more than the Gnostics. And they clearly talked about having to put on our what they called our perfect light as the only way for us to escape the, the negative powers, be they terrestrial or extraterrestrial, that would seek to impede us. And when they talk about putting on your perfect light, they mean achieving a, a state of awakened consciousness and also awakening your heart and becoming a, be, becoming a being of pure light and pure love. That is what it was all about for them. And they believed that that was the only way to, to navigate these times because, or times when these dark forces pop up on the planet. Because if you are able to clothe yourself in the perfect light, then these dark energies, they won't even see you. You won't even be in their reality. And so to, to all of a sudden interject this idea that, hey, you know, if you're following the love and light path, you're being duped, that, that to me is, I don't know, it's not realistic. And to say that there are fallen entities that are posing as gods that are trying to take you to uh, a very dark place uh, by you following the love and light path is just not making sense to me. And it kind of goes along with um, some questions I've had. A lot of people think that, that we, that our U.S. government, the, the black hats, the dark forces, possess Stargate technology, for example. And that's a, an area that I specialize in and have been looking at for, gosh, 15 years or so. And I, I really diff have a, a disagreement with, with some that believe that our dark forces, our government, possesses Stargate technology. And the reason why is because... In the ancient times, anyway, every time you saw examples of beings coming and going from the stars through these star gates, and they were plentiful. They're in Egypt, they're in Samaria, they're in the Yucatan, they're all over the place. And every time you, you find a myth or tradition about those gateways, there's always a message that the only way to get through that gate is as a being of pure light and pure love, that humans cannot travel the stars through these stargates because our vibration just is not high enough. We've got to transform ourselves into these, what we think of as a Christ-like being or as a, as a light being. And based on that, I just am not of the opinion that dark forces, U.S. government or other elite forces, are in the business of creating beings of pure light and pure love. And how it, it could be possible that they could have this Stargate technology just doesn't make any sense to me at this point. I'm open-minded. My jury's out. I would like to be shown proof, but so far uh, none has been forthcoming. 
I think we have a caller, Ms. Paula. Do we have a caller? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Nikki, uh, did you have a question for William? Yeah, actually, I was just wanted to um, just bring up the, the idea of, like, macro micro, you know? You were talking about, like, what's happening in the universe with the planets and everything of that nature. Um, but I see a lot of people that are going through the same thing individually, like within, like we're... It, it, I guess if you're even slightly perceptive of anything that's going on around you, you seem to notice the simple fact of the changes of the earth because we are a part of it just as much as we are a part of things, you know, greater beyond this. And, and, and like the, uh, the pulse, the, the heartbeat of, of planets and, and other things have increased. So has like our energy vibration, um, what do, what, do, what do you see when, when you think of that? So the simple thing that I, I guess those that aren't completely entertained or, or, or stuck in a box watching mainstream media that we actually can feel the changes going on. And I think, like, for me, I, I felt the major change literally January 1st last year, but um, it seems to be getting faster. Um, what, do you, what do you sense? Yeah, that's uh, something people have been talking about. It's a very good question, by the way. People have been talking about that for a long time. I mean, I started doing uh, publishing books in this in this area in the mid '90s, and there was a lot of talk of, about this acceleration then, and the thought that as we get closer to this time of transformation, that only love can exist in our hearts, because as we go through this process, more and more our thoughts are going to become more and more instantly real. It used to be we had a, a lag time between thinking a thought and experiencing the action or taking the action, but now more and more our thoughts and our actions are becoming one. And yeah. the reason why we want to make sure love is the vibration that we're, we're staying in is because if you think a thought of fear, it, too, can become more and more instantly real. Our power of manifestation is, I believe, dramatically increasing, and I think a lot of people can uh, have anecdotal evidence of that in their own lives, and that's certainly one of the hallmarks of this era. This is a, a, a shift in our consciousness where what we think is more and more literally true, and, and I agree with you that as, as happens above, happens below. As happens without, also happens within. So... The Earth is going to, is on her own spiral of ascension. We're on the ride with her, and it's a it's a two way street that we're engaged in here. Kind of like also the idea that um, when people are having issues, especially subconsciously or or even outright conscious uh, issues, that it tends to actually ex uh, come about in physical means. Like like people get like cold sores, even catch a fever, get get sick from being just simply stressed out. And it's something most of us, I guess most people tend to ignore um, that that simple changes, just the idea of simple thought tend to bring actual actual events. Um, the idea of like wishing. Um, I think as, as kids we're kind of basically said that it's your dreams, yeah, it's just your imagination kind of a thing, right? And so abilities that we would have or, or that would have developed over time have basically been pushed down, say, uh, under the under the notion that it's just not possible, you know? Right. <laughs> you're, you're just imagining things, right? But what happens when you have a kid that, say, wasn't taught that? I mean, there there are some of us out there, you know? And, and, and you learn to trust, like, thoughts. When you can read, read people's surface thoughts or, or you can heal or you can do many of things of that nature that, that – that we're told just aren't possible, but but it just has to do with the vibration of everything around you. I mean, it, it's all a matter of energy, and, and we really do consciously, collectively create the quote-unquote matrix that we're all perceiving right now. And and you get into things yes, like what, do. with quantum... Go ahead. No, I, 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 would, I would agree with you that we are all in... We are all together creating this holographic matrix, this reality that we, we call reality, and thoughts are things in this matrix. And we, once we get a hold of that concept, uh, we then can begin to use the power of our thought to, to more and more manifest what it is what we do want instead of what we're trained to, to focus on, which is what we don't want. 
Indeed. And I think that the greatest alchemy on earth is the, to be the controller of your conscious facilities. Understand that we live in two realities. We live in a reality of physicality, of doing. But we also have a whole other reality within our mind that is constantly running 24 hours a day. And because we're so used to it, it becomes normalized and a part of nature. And it runs amok. It's like a child without um, supervision, if you will. And what I mean by this is you could be in your reality making lists and meditating, but when you're not doing that, when you're by yourself, when you're alone, you're thinking all of these things, percolations, oh, I can't do this, oh, that you're ritualizing, if you will, over and over and over and over again, all of these things in reality. And this is why, you know, I've said many times, you all, that what you feed your consciousness is very, very crucial because that seeps in to the subconscious mind and it runs amok even in while you're conscious. So we have to be the keepers of, of this second reality of the mind. That, From my perspective, anyway, the true alchemy of who we are is our consciousness, the way we think, and being able to control those facilities and flip that alchemy of what is being given to us or what we are habitually used to doing. I think a great example, just, just one more thing is most people don't seem to realize, you know, like you keep speaking out loud, you know, hey, I've got a headache and all of a sudden you'll have one. Or people call in sick to work, and I mean, I've got a great example of this, but you call in sick to work and then you people tend to actually get sick just from speaking things out loud. Um, I, I did once, like I called in to work, I didn't want to go, and I called in and said I had a flat tire, and the very next morning I went to work, I, I woke up and, of course, lo and behold, there's my nice little flat, flat tire, but can do that a second time um little things like that that, that seem to actually happen <laughs> you know we don't seem to actually realize it or, or consciously perceive how much of an effect we really have indeed indeed words are things they're 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 energy signatures they're percolating and once you speak them they from my perspective they go into the matrix of the akashic records and permeate and they get fed so what we speak, what we do, what we think, what we visualize are all ritualizations and can be prayers. So we have to be very, very careful as we permeate in this reality with the frequency as high as it is because now since time is speeding up and we are at the tipping point, we are now manifesting our worst nightmares or our best dreams. So we have to be very mindful. Yeah, and that, that is. Uh, a, go ahead, William. That's again, a, a, a kind of a reiteration of what I was saying. It's like, wasn't that the the, the secret of the secret? Focus on what you do want, not what you don't want. And that's and this is why, because our the power of our thought is so tremendously amplified right now. But the problem is, is that if we can get out of this fear zone, if we can leave that behind, then that leaves the only other energy in the universe that we can tap into, and that is love. And once love becomes the base vibration of our life, then that is what opens up all of the gateways. Be it pathways in, in your life on earth or pathways in the, in the cosmic development of your soul. And this is the, the motivation, I feel, that, that we need to kind of plug into this scenario. Why do we want to, to uh, focus so much on becoming beings of light and love? And the reason why is that this is how we, we have a much better existence while we're on earth, but ultimately it's the only way we're going to be able to leave this realm when, we, when our time is uh, up for us to leave. Indeed, and, and technically we're not really leaving. Our organic being is just leaving because we are all eternal. And I know that's a very right. a very twisted and hard concept to wrap our heads, heads around, um, but that is very much true. So, you know, it, like I said, we have to be very mindful um, of what prayers we are living, what we are doing, what we are thinking, because huh, they will manifest in the blink of an eye. And we have another caller. Sleepy Salsa is on the line. Miss Paula is letting me know through the chat room. Is Sle Sleepy Salsa on the line, Miss Paula? Yes, she is. Your microphone Welcome. is hot. 
<laughs> yes, hi. Thank you for having me on. Welcome. Hey, I just I just had a few questions about the uh, the subject matter, and I was reading the kind of show description. Uh, my first one is, how would you folks define uh, awakening or the waking of the soul or waking up? You know, a lot of that kind of lingo. Because the more I ask around uh, different kinds of folks, uh, the more definitions I get. So I just kind of wanted your uh, two cents on that one. Would you, would you like my two cents, or were you ready sure. to Sure. Yeah. No, go ahead, William. Yeah, um, that's, again, a, a very personal definition, and it's not trying to come from an elite point of view that, hey, we're awake and everybody else is asleep. But you can kind of take a look around our, our you know, if you just walk down the street, you'd, you'd get a real good sense of, of what we're talking about. Of, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a matter of focus, in my view, um, in one of uh, the most, to me, intriguing biblical stories is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus wasn't actually physically dead. He was not a carcass in the story. Jesus tells us that. He was, in fact, lacking the, the glory of God. And by that, it meant he didn't have his his light body on. He wasn't radiating light. And to me, that is the, the definition of being fully awake. It, earlier I said that we're all sort of like in a cocoon phase here. We're in a pupil phase. And what we're trying to do is to learn how to morph into the metaphoric butterfly, which is referred to as the light body, the bliss body, the superconductive body, the radiant body, the resurrection body. And so to me, the, the fully awake person, the successful soul, is the soul that has resurrected, the soul that has achieved this ultimate glory body, rainbow body, light body. And so if that is the, the definition, the yardstick, then we all, we all are really the dead that are referred to. We're not fully living. It's like mm-hmm. we all have this wonderful neurocircuitry on our uh, spinal cord system. We call it the chakras. And if we think of the chakra system as a candle and we think of the pineal gland as the top of that system, our fundamental problem is, is that none of our candles are lit. None of our elevators go to the top. Indeed. And this is, this is what we're all trying to work on together. We're trying to get our candles lit. We're trying to get our elevators to go one step higher. And we know our civilization will be successful in that because then there will be no more war. There will be no more poverty. There will be no more imbalance of resources. This is the stuff a dead civilization does, and a, a, a sleeping or sleepwalking civilization does this. Nobody in their right mind would actually uh, choose to have a civilization that is so out of balance with nature and with uh, higher principles, but yet we have chosen that. And the reason why is because we're asleep. And and as we wake up, we're going to say, wait a minute, we don't want to spend another trillion dollars fighting wars that have no outcome or point. We would rather take those resources and develop ourselves as a, as a human race in a peaceful manner. And this is how we will know when we're successful in waking up from going to dead to living beings, in my view. Did that answer your question, Colin? Uh, it, it at least kind of started. I guess the follow-up to that would be uh, for Mr. Henry. Uh, you know, I don't know if I'm awake or not. And so kind of being uh, more of a scientist, I, you know, the scientific method and kind of being a reason and evidence monkey, I was trying to ascertain whether there is a way to quantify or otherwise measure uh, whether someone is asleep and if they or excuse me, awake, actually the other way too, and seeing if there's a, a way of trying to ascertain like how awake they are or whatever, or if it's something so subjective that there's not really a way to kind of uh, uh, measure that. That's that's kind of where I'm coming from because I've noticed a lot of the alternative media is using these terms, and so just trying to understand it is really hard for me because I understand how everyone's using it in context, but defining it, it seems really hard. So is my understanding of this uh, a little too left-brained, or what are your thoughts on that? No, I think it's uh, I think it's really healthy to have that perspective that you've got because it, we all – want to achieve a state of awakening but and again it is very su- subjective but there yet there are various barometers that you can you can use and 
in this genre, I, you know, some of the baby steps, the fundamental baby steps, are a lot of what we've been talking about tonight are the baby steps of the awakening. You realize the power of your thoughts. You realize you're, you're an energy being. You realize you're more than just your flesh and blood. These are big wake-up calls for a lot of people. And you can see how we start to stair-step it from here with some just basic fundamental concepts, and it, it builds out from there. But I think... Uh, Maybe that could be your calling is to help us on this side to, to, to more accurately quantify it, because if you can quantify it, then isn't it possible then to help people to duplicate it so that they know what they're doing? I mean, you, you know if you get on a, a financial peace type program, like a Dave Ramsey program, how well you're doing because you're, you either have money in the bank or you don't. You have either less debt or more. And that's kind of the thing here that's sort of, in a way, missing is that well, a lot of people definitely want to get on a path of, of greater sense of personal peace, power, and freedom, but yet they don't know what are the, some of the, the baby steps along the way that they can check off that will help them know that they're, A, going in the right direction, and B, are successful in their quest. I would agree. And I would also say to the other side of the coin, on the right side of the brain, um, it's something that, like William was saying, that it's very personal and it's something that really can't be described. And there are also, well, this is just from my perception, and there are many different truths in reality, and they're all equally as important to the whole pie. Um there are, there are symptoms, if you will, things that you will notice from your realizing and awakening, if you will. It's almost like the veil of the mundane comes down. You, you will notice certain things in this reality that aren't right. It's almost like when more, and I'll give you a scene of, of what I mean so maybe people can understand. It's the scene in The Matrix when Morpheus and Neo are sitting down and he's giving him the choice of the blue pill and the red pill and he's, you know, saying to him, like, you know that there's, you're permeating in this reality and you know that there's something just ain't right. You you can feel it when you go to work. You can feel it when you pay your taxes. It's this feeling. It's something to be to be lived as well. It's more than just a conceptualized aspect of reality and spirituality because from my perspective spirituality is to be lived and to be experienced through what you're speaking about from um, the left brain if you will um, for example for the past two years I've always had clairsentient and clairvoyant ability since I was a little girl but they've enhanced my sight has been tweaked I've been able to see and hear things a little more clearly. Um, and this has been happening to a lot of people that I know. And this also affects the, the physical body um, because our our energy bodies, if you will, are encapsulated in this, this flesh suit. So, of course, our flesh suit will be affected. Um, people's sleeps are being um, affected. They're getting... I don't know if you've experienced anything like that, caller, but, I mean, it's a plethora of things. We could talk about this subject forever, but just, you know, um, some small examples. Well, I mean, there are certain limitations to science which any, you know, sci which anybody, scientist or otherwise, can easily notice. And, and there's also a lot of phenomenon that does occur in what, you, you know, we usually think of as objective reality. Uh, and two uh, examples of that would obviously be something that the shinobi of medieval Japan would call the force of the killer, where literally you could feel whoever is the intended victim can feel the intention, for lack of a better term, can feel the intention of someone who wishes them harm, even if they're not actually touching them or actually moving, but just thinking about it. Similarly, uh, veterans who have come back. Uh, from various different wars, whether it's Vietnam or stuff since then or, or whenever, have always mentioned that they can feel someone's eyes on them, uh, like usually, usually like an enemy soldier or something like that. So there, are, there's certain phenomena that has been happening over and over again, and, and it's and the case studies are just numerous, but mm -hmm. there hasn't been a way, as, at least as of yet, to actually measure measure such a thing. But we already know from history that. 
there is phenomenon that now can be measured and whatnot uh, that couldn't be before. For instance, it used to be thought of that radio waves uh, were kind of like uh, you know magic, if you will. And it was like no, there's there's actually a reason there's vibrations going through the air and and so on and so forth. So there's definitely a uh, uh, this is definitely can kind of be an area for research, at least in terms of kind of explaining the exact mechanics of it. But I just merely wanted to uh, call in just to see what. Uh, y'all's perspectives were on that and thank you again for having me on thank you so much for for calling in and you may be the one to do that work and when you become famous don't forget about us and we'll, we'll interview you <laughs> <laughs> indeed indeed you know I know we have only five more minutes or six more minutes with you William I have so many questions. I, I, me and Ms. Paula have so many questions to ask you. And you have to come back to the HCL Network and KDCL Media for Door to the Mind because your work is so intriguing. Every time I, I deal in your genre and I listen to you speak, you literally crack open my brain. It's like you, you give me a consciousness massage, literally. Um, what is coming up on the burner for you, William? Well, I've just uh, recently published my new book, The Secret of Scion, and the companion DVD, The Light of Scion, so I'm really excited about that. I'll be uh, going to Egypt in February, leading a tour to Egypt in February. Still have spaces available if anybody would like to join us, and I'm very excited about that. It's been about a year or so since I've been in Egypt and can't wait to get back to the homeland, so to speak, and get inside those temples. And uh, then we just kind of continue on with uh, various lectures throughout 2012. Uh, well, one more question before you go. Since you since you went there, I'm going to ask you one question about Egypt. Uh, why is it that, from my understanding, Miss um, Berger and I, her first name is not coming to me. She's a very well-known Egypt American Egyptologist, been going back and forth uh, to the United States to Egypt, and she's talking about all of these temples and underground tunnels that are now being discovered. But the Egyptian government, Hawassi, is not really allowing individuals to take part in this. Um, new discovery, if you will, and for some reason she, she's been able to get access, if you will, and some of her findings are quite fascinating. Do you think that the, that the Egyptian government, if you will, knows what's going down on the burner? Because from my perception, William, I believe that there are many portals, vortexes in Egypt that are now opening up to bring certain energy on the planet and also discoveries that are up under the, the, the pyramid. What are, what are your thoughts on that, William? Yeah, well, I'm right there with you. My, I call my Egypt tours Stargate Egypt tours because I believe that's what ancient Egypt was. It was the Stargate. I mean, there's a reason why uh, the Stargate TV series, the sci-fi version of it, adopted so many ancient Egyptian terms, and it's because they really they were hitting on what was really going on in ancient Egypt, although I'm not convinced there was an actual device that they possessed in, in, in terms of the technology. It was more of a spiritual technology about activating our capability, but that's uh, a huge part of why I go to Egypt. I mean, I believe that the, the Great Pyramid, if there is a, a, a resurrection machine, a stargate in Egypt, the key one would be the Great Pyramid. It was the, the power source for the whole resurrection culture, ascension culture, stargate culture of ancient Egypt, and I continue to go back year after year in search, in search of evidence and clues of, of that that original science and, and understanding. And there's no doubt that most of the, the of what is yet to be discovered in, in ancient Egypt is underground. I mean, if you go over to the, the step pyramid at Saqqara, which is in the pyramid fields of Giza, it's literally got three or four miles of tunnel systems mm -hmm. underneath it. You just see the structure sitting on the surface, but the rest of it, the real stuff, is all underground. And that is totally off limits. I mean, the Egyptian government, I'm convinced, knows about those tunnel systems. They've been in them. They've, they've, Sahi Owas has shown them in various uh, documentary programs in the past. I mean, it's so tantalizing that they'll take you only so far. They will show you, yes, those tunnels are real, but they will never take you into the real inner sanctums underneath there because that's where 
you find all, all the good stuff, and it's going to be one heck of a day if that if those uh, if that knowledge that's under there ever comes to the surface. And I hope it does. And I hope it's soon. Indeed, and I hope that it's either you or Michael Cremo or somebody <laughs> gets their hands on the goods, William. Like, get your hands on those hieroglyphs, take pictures of them, and decipher. Because when you were breaking down the hieroglyphs of Nefertiti and um, her her husband and their children and the whole shindig, there is information to be had on those hieroglyphs and the release of those um, those beautiful monuments. And I have a feeling, William, as we percolate along in this reality, that Pandora's box is going to be blown open. All the secrets that have been kept for thousands and thousands upon thousands of years are now going to come up to the surface for the world to see. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is the time of revelation. This is the time of the apocalypse, the lifting of the veil. The curtain is going back, and the real world is being revealed to us on a daily basis. Absolutely, absolutely. And please give the family, before you go, William, your website and where people can get in touch with you. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. My website is williamhenry.net. I've got all kinds of contact information there, email, telephone, if anybody wants to get in touch. But just go to williamhenry.net, take a look at some of the, the books and DVDs. Again, the latest one is The Secret of Scion. It has a companion DVD called The Light of Scion. It's all about ancient stargates and transformation and ascension. It's uh, really the product of over 20 years of research. It's all put together in a nice little package, ready to go. Well, thank you very much, William. I hope that you come back and visit us. And it I is it's been a pleasure. I'll be, it'll be my pleasure to come back and talk. Thank you so much, dear. Thank you, Ms. Paula. Thank you, William, and we look forward to, uh, to uh, talking to you again in the future. Me too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> oh, my God. That, let me tell you, I, I have a head rush. <laughs> Woo! My brain. I love talking to William. I love talking to authors and researchers like him they, because they're, I'm telling you, today I literally have a 100 questions, seriously, that I want to ask him. I want to get into every crevice of his, his brain <laughs> to ask him because he's, he's researched. Um, you know, for so many decades ap- about the weirdness, the craziness, the pair, you name it, he's done it. He's, like I said, he's hes in the same yeah. category as Mike Primo and all of these people have been researching for, like, you know, since dirt was invented, you know. <laughs> it's well, that's, that's like, yeah, I, it's like I said, I started in on uh, his blog, some of the blog articles and some of the other articles that he has on his website, and, you know, you just – you know, have to keep going to the next one because it's like, where's the next chapter? <laughs> uh, I kind of got uh, f- fell down the rabbit hole of uh, reading about the dome in uh, in the Capitol. Mm-hmm. Because, it, well, I, I grew up in Prince George's County till the seventh grade, and of course, down there, when you want to take a field trip, they haul your butt to Washington D.C. and take you around all these monuments. But when you're a kid, you don't understand all this. Indeed, and you know now that that I've you know been reading up on this and, and uh, all the all these different things and through all these different authors like William, you know I want to go back and and stand and stare, you know just stand in the in the rotunda and look up, <laughs> and you know and look for all these things that he's pointed out, and um, and I think I figured out what's what's etched in that one crystal pen that. <laughs> I have <laughs> by looking on his website. So um, yeah, it's you know it it makes me you know want to hop in the car and go to D.C. and say, okay, I want to stand here and look at the Capitol dome for a while. Do you mind? <laughs> indeed, indeed, it makes you researchers like William Henry, Lennon Honor, Michael Cremo, Robert Bruce. I mean, the list goes on and on. They literally make you want to get your video camera. And lay on the floor at the, you know, wherever you're at, wherever they're researching, and just video cam and have commentary in the background because it is mind blowing how he literally ties things together. 
and his perspective. Now, I don't I never agree 100% with anyone. You know what I'm saying? I question everything and I take everything in. Um I don't agree with everything that he says, but you're not supposed to agree with everything that an that an individual says. Um you're supposed to come to your own conclusions. But I would have to say for the most part a lot of the things that William Henry percolates on some of the things that I've said in a general universal sense. And I've actually got some of these things confirmed through my own tradition that I've incarnate, incarnated with in this reality as Lukumi. There are many things that are hidden that the elders don't talk about that percolate and are right in alignment with what William Henry talks about when he talks about the, the energy bodies, the, the galaxy, and, and so on and so forth, and the soul, and all of these things. And, you know, when you talk to really knowledgeable elders, not just in the mechanical aspect and mundane aspect of priestly life, but the metaphysics of things, then you start getting down to the nitty-gritty, and you're like, wow, okay, he's saying the same things that my that my elder is saying. This is real deep. So, right. Yeah. Well, and, and he also he's uh, when when he used that uh, term so much, you know, uh, spiritual beings of light. It, it made me think that um, you know, right after we uh, experienced the lightning strike, uh, Oro had uh, joined this group on Yahoo called the Lightning Strike Survivors, and there's also uh, um, a website out there called Lessie for uh, lightning strike and electrical shock survivors. And, you know, one of the names that kept popping up because he is a, a lightning strike survivor is Daniel Brinkley. And Daniel Brinkley talks about everybody being great and powerful beings of spiritual light. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and I'm going, okay. <laughs> and because Daniel Brinkley, uh, you know, was not – the most not the best person walking the earth he you know was involved in espionage and worked for some of the alphabet agencies and and basically was not a good human being but this lightning strike that he survived transformed him it, it was a transformative experience for him just as it was for oro and i and he did like a 360 degree turn and you know he talks about what he experienced you know after you know with the with the, the near death experience that he had uh you know after the lightning strike so it's it, it, you, like you said there's a lot of people who are using the same terminology the same jargon and they're all starting to bubble up to the surface oh indeed and this is why when william first came on you know, William is real humble because he's just like, everybody's opinion matters, which it does, absolutely. But I also, however, I also think that um, there is this reality permeating on top of ours where people use these terms and they're misusing them to indoctrinate fear upon the planet. And mm -hmm. they're, using, they're using it as a tool, as escapism. For example, you know, this whole ascension thing, I'm going to, excuse me, leave the planet. To me, that's escapism from really facing the truth of doing the work of and finding out who you really are. So when I speak of ascension, I'm not talking about that quote-unquote um, popularized new age, um, like everything is, is love and light and you don't have to do any work. I'm not talking about that type of ascension. I'm talking about where we literally um, do the work. Like we always say, if you're going to talk about it, you got to be about it. And to me, that's what ascension really, really is. And that's what, from my perception, what um, William is talking about. So, you know, when I sometimes I, I perceive that when I say certain things, on because I speak in energetic words that, that it's put into this category, but I mean something different. I mean something very different. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, we've had on various shows uh, throughout both, um, you know, our whole genre of shows and yours also, you know, we've talked about um, the, the energy of thought. And it, when you think about millions of people sitting in front of their little, well, some of them aren't such little boxes anymore, but in front of that box. 
and they're watching reality TV. Mm-hmm. And and they're putting thoughts into, oh wow, isn't that really cool? And look, we can do that. Yeah, things like you know, jackass and all those other things that you see. This is what people are putting their thought energy. They're expanding their energy on this kind of drivel. And then they all stand around scratching their head, wondering why you know we're all going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they, they don't, yeah, they don't understand the power of what they're putting out there. That's right, baby. And you know what's even deeper, Miss Paula, is that as you have said, as I have said, as Oba Ernesto Pitarlo has said, as William Henry has said, and many other folks on this, these networks. What you think about comes true. It ain't no new age philosophy. It's actually old age. And, it's science. You know, it's science. Hello. And it's and what's fascinating is it's right in front of people's face, and they don't understand. It's like you speak, you speak, and, you know, it will come through in the physical world of reality, the reality that you live. It works every single time. And if you do a science experiment on yourself and you look at the people in your reality and how they, they talk about themselves and how people relate to them, that's exactly the reality that they live. It's like they're their own prophets. And, they, and some of these individuals are really intelligent and smart, but they're just too, I guess, set in their ways, if you will, to recognize that um that that's what's happening. <laughs> and they will and they saying? will argue and they will argue with you about it. Oh, I mean, indeed. we've had it happen uh, just a couple of weeks ago. You know, you you couldn't <laughs> yeah, the power of attraction. That's what everybody that's that's the buzz phrase of 2011 and 2012 is the law of attraction. Well, anybody who's followed any kind of indigenous tradition has I mean, if you've read the Wiccan read, you've heard of the law of cause and effect, the law of attraction. You send it out, it comes back. But people will argue physics with you all day long that says, oh, no, that doesn't happen. And it's like, uh, excuse me? <laughs> Maybe not in your reality, but it sure does in mine. <laughs> And I think that's why all those times as a kid I got caught because every time I did something wrong, my first thought was, oh, shit, I'm going to get caught. <laughs> Indeed. And I did. So. <laughs> but, yeah, the the law of attraction, if you look on blog talk radio, every other radio show has something on it in the title about the law of attraction. Absolutely. And how and – how, you know, we need to, to sit down and make a list of all these positive thoughts that we're going to have every day because if we don't put out positive thoughts, we're not going to get, you know, attract anything positive. We're only going to attract negative. But, you know, we all know that you ain't going to sit around and have positive thoughts 100% of the time. <laughs> you know, you do the best you can, but, you know, every once in a while you're still going to get that old crap thing going. <laughs> Well, you know, we're human beings, and I think that if one, half of the battle is making the recon, recognizing of where your where your head is at, where your consciousness is, is at, and being aware of that. That's like the, the, the first battle to begin with. Mm -hmm. If you recognize it. Um, and then you stop yourself from doing it. We can change many habits, but like I always say, the question is, are we as a society addicted to the drama, the euphoric feeling that one gets from feeling and permeating in a certain type of way? Because you see a lot of individuals speak of change who are quote-unquote spiritual, but they still permeate in the same way. The question is, are are we addicted? And that's a very hard truth to, to, to say to yourself. Am I addicted to the euphoric feeling of drama, of being in misery? And these are the questions that we all have to ask ourselves this year in order to evolve. It's not going to all be a picnic because I don't believe in that. I don't believe that all of a sudden you're just going to transform into this, you know. Yeah, this wonderful this, creature, yeah. And, and we're all going to sprout wings and fly. <laughs> 
Yeah, to me that's lunacy. You know, it's like to say that everything is negative is lunacy and to say that everything is going to be jolly and we're all going to ascend to this wonderful place automatically is lunacy. That's not the way that reality, nature, if you will, works. We are a part of nature. We are a part of the universe. There's cycles of things. Um, and darkness is not always a bad thing. We have been brainwashed with this perception that darkness and chaos is bad, but there's a beauty to it in a doorway well, of a, evolution. Yeah, I was going to say, as a year of transformation and evolution, we're going to have all kinds of chaos. Indeed. And, and, and instead of pulling your hair out over it, you, you actually have to sit down and look into the in, into the heart of it and see what's there for you because there's something i mean i I think that's where a lot of the fear comes from with this is having to look at yourself having to look below the surface of anything Mm -hmm. because we, we we have skimmed along the surface so long and been so superficial for so long that people fear to look at themselves for fear of what they will see that's true, and, and that's the stuff. And it's going to be those those people who can honestly sit down and yeah, it's to just pull something out of the movies. It's like when Luke Skywalker went down into the cave, and they said the the he said what's in the cave, and Yoda says the thing that you fear the most is in the cave. And of course, you know he has to to show what a macho guy he says. Oh, I'm not afraid of anything. And, you know, it turned out he was afraid of himself. He was afraid of the darkness inside him. Well, we all have that. We, you know, we're not all, uh, we, we, we carry a balance. We, we carry, you know, our temper, um, you know, our anger. Yeah, and the, the part, you know, the, the, the part where we control it is what we do with it. You know, do we do bad things with it? Do we hurt people with it? Or do we acknowledge, yeah, I'm really pissed off about this, but um, let's do something constructive with that being pissed off, you know, and, you know, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, yell at my husband and be raiding because I'm pissed or, you know, PMSing, but, you know, maybe I can do something creative with it, but let me go over here and scream first so I can let it out. You know, look at ourselves and be honest with ourselves, and and I, I, I think that's where the fear from this year is going to come from. It is. You have to feel the force, Luke. Feel <laughs> the force within yeah. you, permeating within you. Well, see, and then you know, that's where that's where I thought you know Yoda was wrong because you know the, you always had to you know beware the dark side. Well, no, why would you beware the dark side? You know, you know, bring the 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 dark and the light together and and, and make it gray and use it. You know, that you know, that was the one place I agree I disagreed with George Lucas. You know? Indeed. You know what's interesting when you say, Ms. Paula, that people are afraid of themselves? You are so on point because I remember a couple of years ago, this was two years ago to be exact, I did this YouTube challenge to my YouTube friends out there, and I said, I dare you to do a meditation where you literally sit in the dark, you have two candles next to you and you look at yourself in the mirror and you stare into your own, you gaze into your own eyes. Do you know that people were like, oh my God, I tried to do it, but I couldn't do it. It it scared me. It freaked me out. I disappeared. And I'm thinking, you're afraid of yourself. Why are you afraid of yourself? And these were people that I've known for a long time, like really seemingly evolved people who talked about, you know, very high concepts of this, that, and the other, spirituality, some of them were like, oh, I'm not revisiting that. Well, that's, like, well that's funny that you mentioned that exercise. I took a, um, when I first moved to Denver, um, the, it was uh, the first place I had lived where they actually had metaphysical shops, and there was one in downtown that I used to go to called Castle Rising, and they gave classes and you know they gave classes on you know tarot reading and scrying and you know uh, wiccan 101 and, and and just a whole wide range of topics and one of the exercises in the scrying class was just what you described and and I've done that and it's a really cool exercise 
It's a very cool exercise, but if you've not, if you're not used to doing that, it can be a very, <laughs> it can be a very scary exercise as well because the experience is is that everything, even with your eyes open, you end up in the element of darkness. Your body disappears. You can no longer mm-hmm. see yourself. Oh yeah. And, oh yeah. And it's something that if you do, you have no. It's to me, it's about control. Because I find that control mm-hmm. freaks cannot do this exercise. <laughs> they, they can't let. They can't let go. See, that was. That's what my hardest part was, and, and I still am to some extent. Um, there's certain. There's certain things I have no problem letting go, but there's other things that that I hold on tight with both hands. <laughs> yep. <laughs> because you know, I've let go so many. It, it's like I'm hoarding. <laughs> I'm hoarding this one little thing that I can still control. And, and it's like, okay, yeah, well, I let, you know, it's a bargain. I'm, I'm making a bargain. Well, I let go everything else, you know. I, you know, I let it all go. I, I don't, you know, I don't have control. Of it, but but I'm hoarding these one, you know, one or two little, <laughs> little things. But you know what, and, and, and being humble on it, I can understand. Because it took me, when I first started doing this exercise, um, years ago, it took me a long time to be able to complete it because it it flips you out. You literally go into the vortex. Everything in your surrounding disappears. You can't see the mirror. You can't see yourself. You literally fall into darkness, and um, you are literally going into the unknown. So I, don't get me wrong. Don't get it twisted, family. Um, I know <laughs> that that can be, it can be very frightening. Because you, you you literally open yourself up, if you will, and there are other factors involved in that um, as well um, mm. that one needs to be cautious of. Because I'm not going to paint like this this tulipy picture. I really believe in being responsible, and when you do exercises like this, that you really protect yourself because you are literally opening right. up a vortex, and you don't right. know. Unbeknownst to some people, some people will tell you, "Oh, well, you can do these exercises and you're safe." And da 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 da. No, <laughs> you have to take precautions, sweetie. I mean, that's just common sense. You don't like um, get in a car. Well, some people do. They get in. The, you know, you don't get in a car and not put on your seatbelt. Well, some people do that, but you know, you you really want to make sure that you protect yourself. So I don't want to like paint this picture. Oh, just you know, sit in front of a mirror and do this that, and then don't protect yourself. You have to take precautions if you will because especially the, a mirror because a mirror is not only a f- reflective object but it has certain metaphysical and mineral materials that deal with the energy of the cosmos and you are literally opening up a per- portal and you can allow things to come in and allow things to leave so one has to, and met all metaphysicians and people who deal in alchemy know this to be a fact. Um, not only because of the principle, the conceptualized principle, but because you said mad some point in time, you may see some things come through that mirror. So you know you got to protect yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and it's not flashbacks from the last acid trip you were on either. <laughs> oh, no. Let me tell you something. The greatest teacher on earth is to do things and to be n- non-mindful of your reality and to just do things. And for me, It'll the teach- greatest teacher, <laughs> it teaches you a lesson because you get a <laughs> You get a can of whoop ass opened up on you <laughs> unexpectedly, and you be like, "Oh Lord, have mercy! I just got hit upside the head with a brick. I'll never do that again." Yeah, well, or- Oro has a term for that. He said, "I just got slapped upside the head." <laughs> Indeed, hello. Oh, you know, so that's and, the best just teacher. totally out of nowhere and has nothing to do with anything. This is KDCL Media's five. Hundredth show. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. Just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> That's awesome. We're working out, working out, working out. Going to the five millionth show. That's awesome. That rocks. Yeah, I thought so. It was like, oh my god, no wonder I'm tired. <laughs> okay, we need rest. We have dark circles in our life. Oh my god. 
Yeah, I even did a video today to prove that, I think. <laughs> I need a cocktail, okay, honey? I need to redo the name. <laughs> Where, where's that masseuse? <laughs> where's that masseuse person at? No, I don't even know what show the HL Network is on, to be honest. Um, it, it's it's probably in that range. I don't even know, but congratulations, girlfriend. Congratulations, well, Oro. I don't keep track of these things, but Oro loves these types of things, these little bits of, of things like that. Like, what show are we on? What show? That's too like, funny. So, you know, once a month or so, I'll, I'll go in and I'll, I'll look and see what show we're on. <laughs> well, happy 500th birthday to you, oh, KTCL. I, 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 yeah, and I don't feel a day over ten, but <laughs> broadcasting said dirt was invented. Got him up. <laughs> yeah, with two tin cans and a string. <laughs> Indeed. But okay, here's a here's a question for you, and it was something that popped into my head um, when you were talking about. Uh, the, the the elders and, and some of the the knowledge that they have that they keep to themselves, and, and there isn't any way to prove or disprove this. But you know, just to throw it out there for conversation, do you think that the elders keep this uh, esoteric metaphysic uh, knowledge to themselves, waiting for the student to come along that gets that? Ding, ding, ding. Absolutely. From my perspective, and this is just from my perspective, there are many truths again out there. This information is quite can be quite dangerous. The information that William Henry is talking see, I don't I don't like I said, I don't walk through the, the tulips and, and pretend that all is always good. There's some things that are okay to work with on by yourself. But there are, you know, there are precautions, if you will, because you are literally raising, this is just from my perspective, the frequency of your frame, which can give you side effects. Well, that's what he was talking about, though, is that we have to, we have to transform ourselves in order to go through the gate. Hello. And you could literally, you can be very ill, and there are, there's tons of documentation on this. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the elders in our tradition, if you will, a lot of the esoteric secrets have been kept due to this fact, and also a lot of them are ceremonial priestly things, um, and they can be used as a weapon, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and when I was listening to some of this information that actually aligns with what William Henry was saying, I was blown away. I was like, well, why is no one really talking about this? And then, you know, that my elder, you know, our elder proceeded to explain why. Um, so one has to be very, very cautious. I am not from the school that everything should be given to everybody. I just, I will never believe that. I just don't because... We really come from a generation, if you will, of people who think that they're entitled to things just because. Yeah. Um, and there's just, a well, just practice. because well, that's, that's the way they were raised. You know, everybody gets a trophy, everybody gets a ribbon, because you know we don't want anybody to feel left out or, or you know, like a loser. Well, in real life, there are winners and there are losers. And then you know, when you throw these kids out of out of the bubble that they've been living in where you know everybody gets a prize you know they're in for a rude awakening and and a lot of them don't make it because they can't uh wrap their mind around the fact that they're not entitled to the same thing that everybody else is entitled to indeed and i mean it wasn't easy for your mother to give birth to you do you actually think it's easy to to work on your spiritual self and knowing and tapping in and actually that's not easy you know what i'm saying so we we there's a generation if you will in all generations it's not just the young young ones nowadays it's all the way up to i know some older people who feel like you know they feel they're entitled to things things are work things are a cycle things are a process 
in order for the betterment of your well-being. These things are very much real, and you could literally, you can hurt your physical being. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, in, 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 in every tradition, whether it be esoteric or indigenous or, or whatever, you know, not everybody is a high priest. Not everybody is a grand master or grand poobah or whatever you want to call it, because not everybody has the ability to to handle those types of energies. Absolutely, and I know that there's things that William Henry knows that he'll probably never speak about publicly because it's just too like, whoa, you know, yeah. seriously. And every researcher that I've ever talked about to talk to about this, like, you know, going back to Michael Cremo, um, I've talked to Michael Cremo, and he's an archaeologist of, of forbidden archaeology and all kinds of craziness. There, I'm quite sure there are things he's seen and discovered that he just he knows from the energetic um, frequency and so on and so forth that you can you, you give a little bit at a time. You get a little bit at a time so you don't burn people out and overload people or you give people information that actually could do them harm. It's actually not, you know, helping in their evolutionary process. It's all about... Um, you know, actually hurting them. And I would I would imagine that the same thing applies to Robert Bruce, who's a very world-renowned astral traveler. And he's probably, you know, been doing research just as, uh, research just as long as William Henry or even longer. And astral travel is no joke. I mean, and he gives things in increments. You know, he, he babies you along. He holds your hand. He's really good at that. So it's like, you know, it's not about... I think the elders and people not wanting to give information is so that you grow in the proper type of way. You know, and I think people misconstrue that. They misunderstand that and they get upset at that. It's like, why are you in such a hurry to learn things? And the universe wants you to learn certain things that will be given at the right place and the right time. That's just how I feel about it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, to, to steal one of your lines, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, David. <baby. laughs> but well, that but that's true, and it, because there are people out there, if you give them an inch, you know, they literally take a mile. They'll go, and, oh, oh yeah, I can do that. Watch this, you know, and it's like giving blasting caps to babies. Mm-hmm. And the next thing you know, they're walking around, you know, a, a few fries short of Happy Meal. Indeed, indeed, and this energy that William is talking about, and you know, old boss, the old, old boss talks about it—the energy of the Odus, the, the, the reading of the year that we will be talking about actually tomorrow on KDCL Media and the HCL Network at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All speaks on the same thing. The things that William was talking about came; some of those things came up in Odu. Mm-hmm. And, these things are very serious. We are literally, not only are we evolving as human beings and our spiritual self, the planet Earth, Mama is moving, okay? Mama is moving. Hello, well, NASA. And, yeah, and the Odu this year was a double, I mean, and that's that's very powerful. Yes, it is. We are literally moving in space, y'all. We are getting a different view. And William talked about all these crazy discoveries from NASA, and it's because we are literally moving into the Milky Way in a different frame. We are getting a different view and being able to see things that we never were able to see before. And all of these doorways are opening up, if you will. Um, So it's like... I'm telling you, we're, everybody's just in synchronicity. We may see it in a different type of way and have different opinions on things, but overall, we're all percolating in that 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 Creole jumbo, honey. I think we lost Miss Paula. I, I said uh, we can't escape it. We're here. Yeah, you know, I'm Indeed. sitting here talking to my talking to my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> But 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 they've you know we've got that whole tail wagging the dog thing going on again because you know somewhere somewhere somebody's going oh well we can't have them all concentrating on this way if everybody becomes a better person then you know we lose control of the masses because we know the easiest people to control is a poor uneducated unarmed public indeed and, indeed you know if, if we keep everybody 
we take all their guns, we keep them stupid, and and uh, we we give them this entertainment on this box, so that they're distracted with bread and circuses. Then we can, you know, the left hand can go over here and do whatever it wants to do, and and nothing gets change nothing gets transformed because you have these small pockets of people who get it and and who aren't distracted by the bread and circuses carrying literally carrying everybody else indeed and to percolate with what you were saying one thing that i don't agree with what william says um is and that's fine because we all should never all agree but i do believe that there is a double-headed sword when it comes, when you talk about um, keeping people on lockdown and in this certain frame of, of being, I really believe that there is two sides of the coin when it comes to these stargates and these wormholes and all these things that we're seeing. There is, a, I am keeping an open heart to the possibility that all of these things could be, some of, not all, but some of them could be false flags for something else. I really believe that the technological aspect of humanity that we think percolates on this planet is not what it appears to be, family. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I have family members in the military. Mm -hmm. I know people in high places in the military, people who were in the Green Berets, um, who have seen things that they will never repeat publicly about technologically advanced things that the government is playing with. So, like, my perspective is a little, it's a little different, you know what I'm saying? I know people who work in, in technology, who work for Boeing or Martin Marietta, who have, like, government projects and are, are dabbling in things that we think is sci-fi. So, you know, the coin can go either way. Only time will tell. Either, I mean, I know that some of these occurrences that we're seeing, like these swirls in Norway and in Russia, are spiritual phenomena, but, however, I think that some of them are like, you know, the government harp. playing around with harp. certain things. Hello. Can you, can you say harp? <laughs> Hello. Hello. I mean, it's a great big radio antenna. Indeed. Indeed. So there there are a lot of things, you know, that there are many different realities that are permeating and percolating. Um, and if you know people in these industries, like you do too, Miss Polly, you know people in the military uh -huh. um, and things of this nature, girl, they, you know, they can give you the inside scoop. Family, if you want to know the inside scoop on the real jig and some things that are going down, talk to a veteran, someone who has a high-ranking position in the military and you know, hang out with them. They eventually they will lo be loosey goosey and tell you some things that you ain't ready to hear for real. What? Yeah. Well, it's like Oro has uh, you know cousins that that uh, work in uh, cryptography, and they say, "Oh yeah, we can tell you what we do," but then we'd have to shoot you. But indeed, <laughs> because their their security clearance is that high because mm -hmm. of what they deal with. So yeah, it's. If you if you think that uh, it's science fiction, it's probably not. <laughs> Indeed. And speaking about cryptology, I I used to know someone who used to to doctor the the pictures from NASA. Like every like if you talk to a regular person and you ask them what they think planet Earth looks like, they give you that that picture of when NASA released. Uh, the the first pictures on the moon and, and the Earth suspended in blackness. Space doesn't mm -hmm. really look like that. They they block out and they, I guess you could say they doctor up all of these pictures to blackness so you can't see what's percolating in the background. That's a known fact. Well, now seriously, now do you think that sky is that clear with all the satellites and all the space junk? They talk about all this space junk that's up there floating around, all these dead satellites, and, and they every once in a while you'll hear them talk about you know one's decaying orbit fall, you know, Skylab, you know, fell to the earth, but we all knew it was up there. But you know, how between the Russians, the Chinese, the French, uh, us, how much crap do you think is floating around up there? Because we've all been shooting stuff in the air since 1957. Fifty-four years, because that's that's the year I was born, and then probably before that, because you know they had all the stuff they were experimenting with to see if 
if you know all the monkeys they shot into space and who knew how many got blown up on the way but yeah there's so there's no way that looking at a picture of earth the the the, the space around earth would be that clear well you'd be surprised to follow the ignorance of people i mean, and i say ignorance because when you talk when you talk to the horse and they they're telling you and they're looking at you like hello this is what I do for a living. I, you understand what I'm saying? It, yeah. And, they're, and, you're, and you're explaining your cases, and they're like, you're wrong, sweetie. This is the reality of it, whether you want to accept it or not. This is what they do, because they don't want you to see what is percolating and permeating out there. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story, and I'm not, I'm going to, hopefully I won't blow up the spot and tell this person's name. I have a family member who works for an uh, an aviation company. Very high security. Don't even know what they do. We'll never know what they do. That's how high their security clearance is. One day we were talking on the phone. Don't know what was going on. Maybe they was having a, a little cocktail and feeling real good. Don't know. What was but we were talking about the moon. <laughs> and the person said to me, they slipped. They re- when they realized they slipped, of course, they shut down the conversation. They said, we can't talk about this over the phone. The person proceeds to tell me, well, you know, the boys didn't, al- they almost didn't come home from the moon. I said, what? Now, I bit my tongue real quick because I knew as soon as I said what, that I would be messing up, messing up the program. You know how they say when you're a yawo? Keep silent and invisible, and you can get tons of information. That's right. The, the the person proceeded to tell me, well, you know, when they went to the moon, quote unquote, they didn't. They almost didn't come back home. And I was dumb enough to say, well, I get got one question out, why? And the person proceeded to tell me, well, I think that you know what the reasoning is, and if you're smart, family which all of you are very smart and intuitive. You can read between the lines of what I'm saying. And then when the, this person realized where the conversation was going, they shut it down <coughs> um, and things of this nature. But there's more to this reality um, than than we perceive it to be. And, you know, I think that a lot of people are very naive about that or they don't want to accept that type of reality because it's very scary. Yeah. I mean, who can blame them? Oh, no, because, you know, when when you get your whole world view tilted, it, it's not fun. <laughs> you know, unless you're the one doing the tilting. But, the, you know, when, when we've had, you know, this conversation with various and sundry other people all through the years, whether it was sitting in a truck stop or, uh, you know, just sitting around, like you say, you know, having a little adult beverage and, and just having, you know, some adult time. And, and, you know, you get into these conversations, you know, somewhere about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning when, it, you know, everybody's feeling kind of tight. And, you know, everybody will sit and scoff at it, you know, and one or two of them may, you know, do a little research on it. But then what they find scares them, so they back off. And, and you know, out of 10 people, you might get one that will actually kind of go with it and, and will change their perspective. But but most people don't want their perspective changed that much. That's true. They don't. But, you know, where I'm standing, anything is possible. So, you know, I take it all in. I take in what I hear from research, from authors, from, you know, people that I know in these actual institutions. So as time permeates on, the truth will be told, family. It will be told. Well, and if you think about it, I mean, just over the last uh, 200 and however many years, you know, we started out as this this little small government, and, and you know, we're the the feds are going to sit over here, and we're going to mind our own business, and you know, we're going to oversee the big stuff, and we're going to let the states and the people take care of everything else. And then you come, you know, flash forward to today, where the government says, "Oh no, the people aren't capable of taking care of themselves. We have to take care of everything." Because people are not smart enough to take care of themselves, you're you're all like, you know, misbehaving children, and and you know we we have to take care of you. Absolutely. So you know, from that standpoint, to say that the other side, if you will, the dark bears don't know that there is a shift going on, and people waking up to me is insane. 
there's always another end of you know the spectrum. And well, and, and the things, and the, you know, people like William Henry and George Norrie and Jeff Rincey, you know, you look at the troubles that Art Bell has had. You know, they they you know he stuck it out for you know a long time before they finally drove him off the air. And and somebody and some people would say, well, now that's just being, being paranoid. And it's like, well, is it? I mean, he won't even come back and live in his own country because of the things that have been done to him and his family. Indeed. So, and is is that being paranoid, or or is that you know calling a spade a spade? Hello. Oh, that. Let me tell you, I would love to have Art Bell on the show to to break that down. Um, that would be a fascinating interview. If you're listening, Art Bell, get in touch with the HBO <laughs> Media and the HBO Network. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh uh, yeah, man. Or, or, or is a big Art Bell fan from way back. I mean, he used, to, and this was before the days of cell phones when you actually had to pull off the road and stop and find a phone. And I mean, he did. He used to stop, you know, go in the truck stop, find a payphone, and call and talk to Art Bell. Art Bell knew Oro by name. <laughs> And they used to talk about all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I love our build. And, you know, you can't forget the infamous. I will never forget this phone call as long as I live because I was actually listening that night. When this guy, the scientist, I believe he was a scientist or maybe it was someone who worked at one of the Area 51 facilities um, who called in and was given the 411, and he broke down on the phone, and then the phone got cut off. Everybody got cut off the phone line. That was the most chilling, chilling, I repeat, chilling phone calls that I've ever heard on live radio. I mean, everybody, I tell you, when that, when that, when Art Bell got that phone call, people were talking about that. For, I mean, they're still talking about it. It was one of the most startling phone calls that one could ever hear. Well, Sure. You know, it's not it's not often you hear your government at work on on AM radio. <laughs> Indeed, he was literally breaking it down like this is what's going on behind the scenes and this is what is is percolating and blah blah blah. And you could hear like the desperation in this guy's voice and he even broke down on the air. I mean, I'm telling you people were stunned. Um, I have to go through the, my archives, actually, because I actually have the phone call. And one day, when we're on Door to the Mind, I'm going to play that, that phone call because it literally, I don't know what it is about that phone call, Ms. Paula, but it just makes the hair on the back of your neck raise up. Um, and it could it could have just totally been a hoax. I mean, who's to say? But the, I always say the visceral reaction that, that a lot of people re- receive when they listen to that phone call it was startling. Um, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting year in the years ahead, I tell you. A lot of things are going to come out. Yeah, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be here telling people about it. <laughs> and you know this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, we we have about 13 minutes left to go here this evening on uh, the door to the mind for another Thursday evening, January the 12th, and uh, the day's ticking off to December the 21st. <laughs> I, I, I just had to stick that in there. <laughs> 2012, the year of the apocalypse! Bring out your dead, the end is near. Just kidding, everybody. I, yeah, I, I just, you, I got to poke that stick, you know, take that stick and poke it. <laughs> of course, you knew I had to do that at least one show, y'all. I'm going to be doing that all year, so y'all better get used to it, y'all. We got we to laugh. You can't, be, you can't be so uptight. You got to loosen it up a little bit. Well, sure, you'll make yourself more nuts than you already are. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, we, Thursday, or uh, Friday and Saturday. I'm so excited about Friday and Saturday, I can't talk about it. <laughs> Friday and Saturday, we got some heavy duty stuff coming down on After Dark and uh, the Community Knowledge Project. And 
Yeah, uh, tomorrow night, uh, Oba Ernesto Pichardo will be speaking about the, the sign of the year, and that will be at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time on After Dark. And then on Saturday night, uh, Oba will be joined by another Oba Oriente, Carlos Valdez, uh, and, and they will be uh, reiterating what was talked about on Friday night, but they will be doing it in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking audience because there's a lot of people in our tradition uh, for whom Spanish is their first language. So that will be at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Saturday. And that yeah, will be... Yeah, and, and, and unless uh, we have something special that we schedule on Saturday, that will be KDCL Media's last Saturday show for a while. Yeah, need to, to, to separate that a little bit, and, and that's that's all good. But that this coming up Saturday is going to be out of sight. We're going to be very busy. I'm, I can't wait to hear what Oba has to say about all this. Uh, yes, because uh, with, the, with the, the Odu being a mehi, uh, you know, we we talked about the uh, the doubles being portals, so it'll be interesting to see uh, what his idea of what that portal will be uh, allowing in or out. Oh yes, indeedy, Mama, you ain't never lied. And the fact that it's thirteen, thirteen, ooh, Lord have mercy, Lord. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's gonna be oh, it's gonna be very interesting. So I suggest, family, that you guys check it out, and also make sure that you check out kdclmedia.weebly.com. That's w e e b l y dot com, and also the H two O network w e e b l y dot com as well. Uh, you'll be able to catch the archives on both websites of Door to the Mind, also the reading of the year. Also, it might behoove people before tomorrow night that you go back into the archives of the Odus of the year and, you know, check it out and things of this nature. And also to look at other people's uh, letters of the years, where you are, the, the letter of the year that came out of Puerto Rico and Cuba and also Miami, and I know that there are some other letters of the years that have fallen out. They all connect together, family. So maybe you should check that out before you guys come hang out with us tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the Spanish Espanol version of the Odu of the Year at KDCL Media and HL Network will be at 9 East p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then we'll be back on our regular schedule Sunday with Egun and Ensam at 7 p.m. And, uh, uh, what, uh, and what are you doing on Sunday? Are you doing uh, Eagle's Nest? On Sunday we have the Eagle's Nest at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then on Monday we'll have um, Buffalo Talk. And on Tuesday, I have some things coming up. You guys, my head is so full. Um, you guys have to make sure that you keep on the burner at HO Network. And, um, and ch KDCL. check all the, yeah, check all the calendars at orochango.com, at uh, the H2O Network .weebly com, also at um, communityknowledge.weebly com. Check out the three calendars to keep track <laughs> to keep track of all of our shows, classes, and lectures. Uh, that we have coming up because we we there's a uh, for anybody in the Lukumi tradition or who is interested in information about the Lukumi tradition, a lot of great lectures and classes coming up. So you want to make sure you check all the calendars, watch the Facebook pages because we're all over Facebook. Dia has uh, two profiles: Dia Nunez and U N E Z. Uh, friend them both. <laughs> KDCL Media has uh, K KDCL Media presents, and we also have a fan page. The H2O Network has its own fan page. Oro and I both have our personal pages. We're on Twitter, um, Google Plus. Uh, we're just all over the place. Uh, so uh, we're just, everywhere, uh, baby. That, that's it. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. Oh no, that was Chicken Man. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> If you're old enough to remember Chicken Man. <laughs> yeah, we are every Oh, wait a minute. You have to tell the family about um, Chasing the Silver uh, Eagle because we're, we're on YouTube as well, family. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash KDCL Media. 
Um, I, I've been bad this week. I've been playing a little bit of hooky. Uh, but I, Oro's got some great footage from when he was going through Pittsburgh and the Fort Pitt Tunnel. It's kind of like one of those fractal LSD trip things. <laughs> And I uh, want to get that up, but uh, look for all the, the videos for, for chasing the Silver Eagle as Oro Chongo and his secret persona as Snake chases the Silver Eagle in his big burgundy Peterbilt and takes you across the interstates of America and all the fun things you get to see from behind the wheel of a tractor trailer. Awesome. See, see what it looks like 10 feet up off the ground. You can see everything and i mean everything and there are people who will show you everything <laughs> oh my god that's too hilarious <laughs> but too true I, there's not much that i have not seen looking out the window of the cab of a truck <laughs> you gotta love it gotta love it love that series of chasing the sil the silver eagle most definitely i think that's about it miss paula do we get everything um, well, uh, well, we do want to tell everybody, though, to come back next week at 6 p.m. for the next edition of Door to the Mind, where our special guest will be uh, Janice, is it Barcelo? Yes. Uh, who is uh, has some uh, interesting things to talk about, about the birth process, the trauma of birth. Um, what's some of the other things that she's involved in? She is um, a doula family. I'm telling you, you will not want to miss this show, for real. We get down with the metaphysics. Y'all know how we do here at Door to the Mind. She is going to take you there. She's going to make you think about some things that you maybe probably didn't think about previously. And to all of you individuals out there who are part of the local me tradition or any esoteric tradition, this is most definitely a must listen to. This goes in correlation with the Egun series that Oba Ernesto Pitrazo has been doing. I'm telling you, some of the things she's going to say are going to twist you, going to turn you, going to flip you on your head. Get ready. Put your seatbelt on because we're going to go to a place that we've never gone before. We've been doing that a lot lately. It's kind of fun. I, I <laughs> love it. When you have, especially when you have a partner in crime. <laughs> That's right, baby. <laughs> so, but we want to thank everybody who joined us tonight here live on Blog Talk. Also, all those who will listen to us in archives, and all y'all, all y'all, that all will y'all, all y'all that will download the MP3 podcast to your phone or your iPad or iTunes or iPhones or uh, iPods, that, that's the word I was trying to think of, iPods, all your little i devices, your Zooms and all those other MP3 devices that you listen on. Uh, download us, take us with you over at kdclmedia.weebly.com, over at iTunes, and uh, we appreciate the support. We really, really do. And uh, join us back here tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time for After Dark, and we'll do it all again. And uh, so till then, I just want to say... Bless everybody. Be careful. Tag, little brother. Y'all be careful out there. And uh, Mm -hmm. we will talk to y'all later. And uh, everybody else, uh, thank you and good night. Love y'all.